Hello, everyone, and welcome to the midweek program at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. My name is Blake, and I'm the education assistant here at the Arboretum. And today we are under the awning at the visitor center because it is a blustery day with some weather that the sky could open up at any minute. But we wanted to be out in the garden. We wanted to be outdoors because today we've got a garden conversation for you. We have Patrick McMillan here in the garden, and we have Dennis Carey, our curator, here to interview him. And they are going to talk about any and everything that comes on their mind. It is a garden conversation. It is not limited to gardening, but it will certainly be very good garden centric and it's just going to be a wonderful program. Alrighty, those of you watching this on YouTube, uh, please like this video and subscribe to our channel and feel free to leave a comment down below. And with the announcements out of the way, I think I can pass things over to Dennis to have us a nice little conversation with Patrick McMillan. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome. It's a, a almost hurricane weather. <laughs> Uh, but we'll, we'll get by. We're here under the protection at, at the visitor center. Um, before I get started talking with Patrick, um, I do, there's one other thing I do want to mention upcoming, uh, that will make you want to sign up to be a member is, um, one of our members only, uh, benefits that we do is every year we uh, distribute free seeds. Um, we, we trade seeds amongst, uh, other botanic garden. It's called our index seminum. And we always end up with leftover seeds which we then turn those around and offer those to our members via uh, our member version of an index seminum, uh, which we call the member seed distribution. Uh, so our members will be receiving an email very shortly, maybe early next week, maybe, um, with a uh, link to a, a, a catalog where you can check off uh, some seeds. It's always a big, it's one of our biggest member participation events. Um, and uh, hundreds and hundreds of our members uh, participate. And last year we had to pack over 3,000 packets of seeds uh, to satisfy all the orders. So uh, make sure you do that. That's, that's real fun for everybody, uh, except for me, because I got to pack all the seeds. So today I'm talking with uh, uh, Patrick McMillan, who I, uh, we had lunch a month ago and I'm, I, I was told it's okay to call him Pat because <laughs> yeah. he goes by Pat at home. Uh, so uh, I might switch back and forth. Uh, Patrick is, uh, has currently is the, is a horticulturist yeah, that's right. at the downtown Cary Park. And so if y'all, any of y'all are from Cary or been to the park and have any questions about the downtown Cary Park, uh, go ahead and post them in the chat and, uh, Blake will read them out. Um, he took the job over, I guess, before they opened up, but after the park had been built. Yeah. So, um, you can ask him about, the design de design decisions then and and what's going forward and that kind of thing it'll be it'll be very interesting he's got a lot of plans there um before then patrick and i both worked at the same place but not at the same time juniper level botanic garden and he was their director of gardens there and before that uh uh he was at windcliffe gardens no Heronswood. Heronswood yeah, gardens director at Heronswood. and then before that he was at um clemson university he was a professor um and I, I, I only, I'm only going back that far because um, while at Clemson, he had a TV show uh, that was on PBS. And later on, we're going to talk a little bit about the TV show. But I wanted to get started by asking you uh, to talk about downtown Cary Park. Sure. And your job there and what's going on with the park and yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. So the park is um, it's wonderful. It's uh, if you haven't been to the downtown Cary Park, you should definitely check out the downtown Cary Park. Uh, it is, uh, it's everything you'd want in a park and then some. Uh, in my opinion, it's definitely one of the best urban parks that's been built in the country. Um, the, the park is a little over seven acres, but it has everything from skywalks to, uh, you know, playing fields. Uh, you can go out, you don't have to bring your own ping pong table and our ping pong balls and paddles we've got them there ping pong tables foosball anything and everything you can imagine doing in the park pretty much sure. you can do there and my job there is to is a little different and i'm really excited about like kind of being able to use my plant knowledge in this way which is that there my plant knowledge is really designed to do exactly what we're going to talk about today which is provide for people provide for um, diversity in wildlife and use those plants to solve problems. And that, that's the part I really uh, like about the job is the opportunity gives me to actually custom tailor 
plant selection to do what we wanted to do for more than just, oh, it's a weird plant from, you know, Yunnan that nobody else has, so we're gonna grow it at J. You know, <laughs> it's, it's more than that. It's we, we're planting plants that serve a purpose in the landscape um, and serve a function. Keep people where you want them to be, um, direct them where you want them to go, and hold the soil and hold the place together. You know, awesome. So it's fun. It's great. Yeah. And I'm really enjoying working there. The town of Cary is a, a wonderful place. To and work. you've been working there for how long? Since November 1st. Since November. Okay. Yeah, so, so just a few months. So I'm new to the new to the town and new to the park. Yep. But the park is also very, very new. It's Yeah. We just we, opened up uh, two weeks after I started. There you go. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, uh, I wanted to... Uh, Patrick and I had lunch about a month ago where we talked about talking points and our hour, hour and a half conversation wove in and out. And I have some talking points I want to bring up. So we're, we're going to jump around on subject. And of course, y'all are free to put a question in the chat and uh, that'll serve as a jumping off point for other conversations. But the first thing I want to talk about, other than the uh, downtown Cary Park, is... Um, Patrick is known f uh, for a couple of, I, I guess you call these mantras or sayings, um, <laughs> yeah. planting for diversity yeah. Garden and for life. natural yeah. community gardening. Right, natural community gardening. Uh, so I, I would like you to go ahead and talk a little bit about those subjects because uh, most of our audience are home gardeners sure. and that's why they're watching our Absolutely. program. Yeah, and you know, um, I guess maybe I'll circle all the way around to the end of most of my presentations and bring it to the forefront, um, which is that it doesn't matter whether you're, you know, you have a balcony in Brooklyn or you have 90 acres in, you know, Edgecombe County. I, it, it doesn't matter. Your choices in what we decide that we're going to do in our little personal space um, have a huge impact on the world around us. And it's something I learned many, many years ago. When I first started out working um, in ecology in South Carolina, and I learned the lesson really poignantly because I was I was working with a guy named Dr. Richard Porsche, and and Porsche Rayner and myself um, just completed a book on the wildflowers of South Carolina. It just came out last year, mm -hmm. um, and it, Richard and I Richard started taking me out to um, these things called shell mounds, shell mounds, and what they are these fantastic piles of shell. They're essentially garbage. But because these piles of shell that were put on, our, on the coastlines of South Carolina were put there so long ago, we're talking like late archaic period. So one of the largest is 5,200 years ago. People piled up oyster shells. And the fact they piled up oyster shells on these acidic sands created a high calcium environment in a very acidic sea around it. Uh, if you will, a sea of acidic soils with a little calcium, high calcium community. And because those people piled up shells, whether it's these great big ones or even just what we call a kitchen midden where you had an oyster roast and you dump a bucket of shells on the ground 5,000 years ago, you'll get sugar maple trees growing where normally there's live oaks. And to me, when I saw that, I was immediately stricken with like, holy cow, you throw down a shell, you change the world. What in the world are we doing at home yeah. You know, when we choose to plant and we choose to, to condition our soil, soils, when we choose to, to lay down an impervious or pervious surface, what we choose to build out of, the world doesn't forget that stuff. It goes no, on and for on for thousands and on. of years. And, yeah. you know, we oh. see that most poignantly as gardeners. And, you know, this is why I always tell people that, you know, you can't really be a good ecologist if you don't have a garden. Mm -hmm. You can't really fully understand what, how one thing changes an entire web unless you have your hands in the dirt and they look like mine, all, you know, matted up in brown. <laughs> but you, you don't understand unless you see the power of, of adding or subtracting one thing from a small space. And so you got to get your kids, your grandkids, whoever you can, make sure they get their hands in the ground and get gardening because that, that's where we reclaim and really learn more about our importance and the importance specifically of our traditional interactions with the landscape that have been so important defining now we know as ecologies caught up with our understanding of, of how long humans have been here and how we've modified land um, it, it brings us back to understanding that we're as big a part of nature as anything else 
So yeah, we're not separate from nature. We're we not, are part not of absolutely. It. Yeah. yeah, we're not. So you know, when in North Carolina, when we go down to the places like the Green Swamp, and you visit these, you know, incredible burn longley pine sit ends, you think, oh, this is so great. It's entirely natural here. Well, it's only like that because once every two to four years, you've got Nature Conservancy people out with drip torches burning, and before them, it was forest managers burning. Before them, it was people who wanted to hunt quail burning. Before them. It was Native Americans who were purposefully adding the fire to the landscape on a more frequent schedule than would be solely uh, achievable through lightning strikes to create open habitat, to create more um, productivity and food and more ease of being able to get at that food for their families. So understanding how important we are and that there is not a place, and I've been to some really remote places, I don't care if you're in the Galapagos or you're in, in the rainforest of Southern Chile or in Antarctica, there's no place in the world you can go where human beings haven't been part of uh, the natural cycle of things from the time we first walked upright. So sure. that's important to me. So natural community gardening, um, is an idea, a concept that I came up with in South Carolina when I was um, gifted with the directorship of the South Carolina Botanic Garden, which happened around 2010. And I was already like doing three different administrative roles and being a professor at the time. And the vice president said, how about being the director of the South Carolina Botanic Garden? And you remember, we had that little bump in the economy <laughs> in 2008. Yeah. And that was sort of the, the pits of it. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of staff that you know we didn't fire people at clemson was really a nice thing they they did voluntary separation in other ways to reach the goal of, of achieving a fiscal balance without having to actually lay people off but when they john kelly asked me to do that i was like no and he said oh that's too bad i was really hoping to keep it around i was like what do you mean if i don't do it you're gonna <laughs> he's like you sure you don't want to i said all right i'll do it so I did it, and initially when I took over there uh, as interim director was my first title there. And um, as when I did, I did it out of the kindness of my heart. But I, what I inherited there was a, a just flat, almost zero budget. We didn't have enough money to buy mulch. Um, and I had three people working the grounds of 295 acres. Okay, okay, so I don't know how big <laughs> the, the, the our park's only seven acres, and I can't imagine doing it. Yeah with three people. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, and so we had to come up with an idea that would, would start to give us some uh, visibility, attract people to want to be part of what we were doing. And I, somebody told me one time I was doing a, a presentation down in Charleston for the Charleston Garden Club right after I became director before the first Christmas. I was director in October. Before the first Christmas, I'm down there. And, and it, this garden club gal, she told me, she said, you know what the problem with the South Carolina Botanic Garden was? And I said, I know a list of them, but go ahead. She said, doesn't represent South Carolina. What she was thinking of was we didn't have the climate to be like Charleston, mm -hmm. right? We don't have Spanish moss. We don't have, you know, all the gardenias, camellias, etc. You know, we did, but she didn't know that. Um, and we didn't look like the low country. But when I mulled that over in my head, I thought there isn't a garden on the East Coast that really has ever attempted to truly capture not just the diversity of an area, but the ecology of an area of a state. So we have great natural um, native gardens. Mm -hmm. The North Carolina Botanic Garden right next door sure. to us yeah. is our partner uh, in plant conservation, very important. And they have little snippets. Um, and when I worked over there as a student with Rob Gardner, you know, developing some of these habitat gardens was, was kind of the theme. Well, I wanted to take that and I really wanted to give people the experience of walking our state from the mountains to the sea. And so we developed a 64 acre exhibit with all of the rock type, the soil type, the hydrology and the ecosystem processes. So if it needed to burn, we you lit burn. it on fire. Okay. And we did it in a way where as you walk through the Natural Heritage Garden, you were surrounded by the community. You couldn't see out of it so that you get the feeling of being actually transported to a maritime forest, to a maritime grassland, to a shell midden, a shell ring, which we built there, to Longleaf Pine Savannas. And it, it shouldn't have worked, and it did. Great. <laughs> so yeah. um, we built it. And it got me to thinking on a wider, um, in a wider way about how we put together gardens. Now, 
to be a natural community garden does not mean you have to duplicate everything that happens in a longleaf pine savanna. But to be a natural community garden is to incorporate all of the things that happen in a natural community. And that includes our interaction with it. You know, it's mm -hmm. not taking us out. Um, so it's how does nature really arrange itself with our help, you know, outside of a, a standard English garden? How does it work? And, you know, it's, it's kind of the opposite of everything that we do for gardening uh, in mass in the South. So in the South, we want everything sheared into round balls separated mm -hmm. by uh, a mile of mulch mm -hmm. and kept where they are, never touching each other and, and totally controlled. And that's, that's a hangover from colonialism. You know, yeah. that, that is the style of gardening that Europe was doing in the 1700s. Right. When you go, rich Europeans. Yeah, yeah. And not the everyday ones. Not, right, rich Europeans. And so when we go to the great gardens in Europe today, it's hard to find that. You can go to the throwbacks and, and see them. But most of the great gardens in Europe today abandoned that a long time ago. And the style of gardening that they're using essentially is natural community gardening. And what, what does that mean? It means that um, I love life. <laughs> It's they, they, so different from doing a TV show. Our audience actually can't hear the train very well. <laughs> oh my gosh. Our mics are, <laughs> That's are great. Good. You got good mics. Yeah. Um, but it's making sure that you have um, as much of your land completely covered with living things as possible. Nature abhors a void. It doesn't mm -hmm. leave a void. And so when you go to beautiful natural communities, what you, you don't see seas of mulch. You see every space is occupied. Maybe occupied in the Piedmont forest with roots mm -hmm. and not so much above ground, but it's occupied. And the more that you can pack into a piece of garden, um, the longer you can extend your flowering period um, and the more diversity of habitat you can provide, even if it's in a windowsill box, the more life you create with that. And the yeah. more life you create with that, the more life we support. And the better life is for everything else, the better it is for us too. So in a nutshell, that's natural community gardening. Fill all your space, use uh, as much ground cover as you can. Try to make as many flowers as quickly and as often as you can with your piece of property. And you're gonna see life explode. And so we did, we changed the entire garden there um, to that style of gardening. And um, when we did that, we, we, were, we were lucky because we had um, many, many years of data um, from activities that happened because we were in Clemson. Mm -hmm. And so the one that captured my attention was a breeding bird data. We had over 100 species of breeding bird, of, uh, not breeding birds, but birds, over 100 species of birds that had been observed over 50 plus years of bird counts and bird watchers there all the time. After 10 years of doing this, we'd gone up to 219 okay. species of birds yeah. on the ground. And, you know, when we compare that with huge pieces of land like Grandfather Mountain, that's more than Grandfather Mountain sees, and it's on a major flyway. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of that if you build it, they will come. Sure. And so my life has been filled with since that time with trying to get people to understand that um, it's not a, just a native versus an exotic thing. It's making sure that what you plant is productive for the place. It's a production you're in. thing, yeah, the an efficiency thing. thing, and it's a holistic yeah. approach. It's a yeah. holistic approach. So awesome. I'm not at all passionate about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you sure are. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny, you know, we have a, our, our start here was similar to that start yeah. in that uh, JC is just JC Rawson and, and one or two part timers and kind of bootstrapped themselves up. And, you know, uh, we were lucky to have a lot of students helping and volunteers. Yeah, helping some crazy students like that. that drove over from Chapel Hill to help plant the guys yeah. around the gravel lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. So. Yeah, um, but that's that's really uh, an interesting story. And I'm sure I, I'm going to stop right here and ask Blake if there's any questions coming in, because just that that little prelude there is enough to uh, generate. Sure enough. So Darla says that she first off loves the downtown Cary Park and she wants to know if you're focusing on planting natives there. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we are uh, we're, we're the past three weeks. I've added close to 90 new taxa of plants, all of which are North American natives. Um, the park is kind of, was designed for, with native plants in mind, but native 
native trees and then native and a mixture of things that are well adapted to here is kind of our what we planted um, but there's some great designs um, up around what we call Park Street Courts, so along Park Street in the garden, uh, or in the park. It's going to take me forever to stop calling it a garden. <laughs> in the park is, um, is a beautiful kind of, um, you know, prairie or meadow style uh, planting all natives. Um, and then the Botanic Garden sector, which is still kind of under, con that's the only part that's not 100% completed in the, in the garden, the initial design. Uh, is also dedicated to that. So roughly half the park is strictly natives. And we're filling the rest of the park with as many natives as we can get in there. But in a lot of places, in a lot of, a lot of times, you'll find situations in an urban park where they're, it's difficult oh, yeah. to put a native that can stand to have 3,000 children walk on it every single day. Sure, and pollution, you know, car yeah. exhaust and yeah. things like that, yeah. and road salt. So that, that's yeah. the part I really enjoy is that sure. we're using plants um, to solve and problems and to work with people, not not fight against. Can you give us a teaser of a few of the um, native taxa? I think our oh, yeah. listener well, would so want to know some names. So one of the big things uh, that I'm trying to do after, you know, when you open a, a site like that, you have sort of the, you have the, the bones of the land, landscape put in. And so we have great bones there. And now it's how do we add those things that support our local uh, biodiversity. So um, we just put in a plant I got to talk about because it's, I think, the best perennial plant introduced in the last couple decades. But like uh, narrow leaf milkweed, um, a selection called Sonoida. Sonoida. Yes. Yeah, so an S or a C? S O N O I T A. And um, one of the best sellers at at uh, Plant Delights Nursery. Um, it, it's a great story. Um, but this plant is a milkweed that blooms from late April, early May until September. Um, okay. It's long, not like tropical bloom, milkweed. Right? It doesn't keep blooming mm -hmm. into the fall. We don't have the same problems that some people believe we have with monarchs uh, using this plant. Of all over 50 species that we grew at juniper level, this one attracts more monarchs than any other, and you can produce more monarchs on this plant than any other milkweed. And the reason for that, imagine, this is a milkweed that is clumping, it's semi-woody at the base, okay? And it's ever blooming. So it's constantly branching out, reflowering, and it's a ball of white for like seven months. <laughs> and your um, monarchs will come in and completely defoliate the plant, and in a matter of about three weeks, that plant's in full flower again. And it's getting another brood of monarchs to create another whole, another uh, a, another whole round of butterflies. And so uh, that's just one of many, many plants and, and really focusing on getting those things in that provide us the greatest amount of support, uh, life support for our, our local biodiversity, for birds, for bees, for beetles, for wasps, for all the mm -hmm. things that, that we depend on. And Sonoid is great. That, that, is what we, that is not a North Carolina native. We have North Carolina native milkweeds in the garden. But it's a great example of what a lot of my research has been on, which is how do we find the best plan to support our, our native biodiversity that is doing no, as little harm or no harm to the environment as we can, but being a benefit to the environment, satisfies the challenges that anybody who's grown anything in, oh, for more than the last 10 years is seeing, which is that we don't garden in the same climate we used to. No, yeah. Volatility is up, droughts are more extreme, flooding is more extreme. So how do we select things that can look great in a landscape, in an HOA. Right, that satisfy us as satisfy us humans. In an HOA and still do all the things that a wild and crazy, totally native local garden that I love do, but that everybody can yeah. do at home. Yeah. And that's one of the great things about having a, a, a public space that has 6,000, average of 6,000 visitors a day is you get the opportunity to contact that many people with that, that piece of ground and sure. really passively introduce things to them that they can introduce in their own home, even living in a place like I do now in Nightdale, where I, I have a very strict HOA. Sure. I want to have 
milkweed, you know, but I can't have one that runs all over the place. I have to have one that does what, what we needed to do in, in the landscape and still supports biodiversity. So that's the kind of thing. Um, and we've put some crazy stuff out there. Um, it, it's basically going down the talks I do that's the best new native plants for the, <laughs> um, I should mention that Sonoida. Uh, Sonoida refers to the place where I first collected the seed. Um, which, which is, is Sonoida, Arizona. Sonoida, Arizona, yeah. So okay. Asclepius angustifolia is native from Texas um, to California, south into Mexico. And many of the plants that I've introduced into horticulture come from that region. We call it the Chihuahuan Desert mm -hmm. ecoregion. Um, that region's really fruitful for those of us who want to uh, introduce plants that don't require us to use potable city water watering our landscape, but also survive humidity, drought, yeah. cold, because the Chihuahuan Desert is incredibly volatile. They can get rain at any time of the year. They have a summer monsoon, so they're humidity tolerant. But they also can go two years without rain and be just fine. Um, and so those are the kind of plants that we want to encourage people to plant into the landscape so that we're conserving life, but we're also conserving resources like drinking water. Yeah, we have a, a cephalanthus around here that came from that part of the country, too. And also mine. Yeah, just yeah. desserts. Yeah, just desserts. Yeah, and, and <laughs> yeah. We're, we're real happy with that one. Yeah, yeah, that's same also an thing. Arizona thing. Yeah, um, yeah same region. It, it came from a dry wash in uh -huh. near, uh, near so, Arizona. so I think Tony's website just ran out of that Asclepius <laughs> based on that was a good sales it's, pitch. I'm telling you, it's it's amazing. That's an incredible plant. And that's what we need more of. We need more yeah. of that. Yeah. Um, well, awesome. Uh, so that's going to lead me into our next uh, bit of conversation is um, uh, we, we, we had lunch that day. We were talking about plants to satisfy your HOA, but also need to meet the... Uh, uh, the changing climate, the volatility that we're experiencing, both rain and drought and heat. Yep. Yeah, let's, yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's a little windy. Uh, a little windy. <laughs> um, and, um, uh, and, and what are some other things that gardeners can do to um, have a garden that can tolerate that stuff and still, still be a good gardener for people, for aesthetics, mm -hmm. and for uh, uh, yeah. wildlife? Yeah. So another plant that I just put in um, at the park, uh, it's another one of my favorite uh, plants. And I, I like to use it, what, I, what people refer to as living mulch. I, I hear it called green mulch. I don't like green mulch as much as I like living mulch, but essentially it's a ground cover. Um, but it's not a crazy, wildly spreading ground cover. It's, um, and it's a North Carolina native, um, Cicerinchium nashii. Uh, it's a blue-eyed grass. Okay. Okay. So a lot of people have put in a blue eyed grass and they planted angustifolium. Yep. And it's okay, but it kind of flops over because the stems are so long and the flowers aren't too big. And for being in the iris family, it's a bit of a letdown. And then it makes seeds and it goes everywhere. Okay. Right. Um, there's a selection from Swanee, uh, the Swanee River, called Swanee, from the Swanee River in North Florida of a North Carolina native species. Uh, Cicerinchium nashii swanee. You're starting to see it for sale all over the place, but it's, a, it's another plant delights uh, introduction. Um, it does not form seed in our area, so it doesn't spread. Okay. And it slowly, through little rhizomes, forms this incredible dense, like Ophiopogon plus all right. density sure. of a carpet that n weeds will not appear in, right? And it flowers with huge uh, blue flowers in April through May. Yeah. And it looks clean all year round and it's evergreen. Wow. So it's, a, it's ideal for planting in a place where you thought, oh, well, I can only put liriope there. Or I can only put Ophiopogon there. You can also put Cicerinchium nashii swanee. And that has nicer flowers than and it liriope has and big, beautiful Pogon. flowers yeah. on it and supports uh, lots of pollinators with that flower too. Yeah. And that's another thing. A lot of people want to reduce the amount of weeding they do. Yeah. Mark gave a wonderful talk at a, a conference or a symposium we were at. I guess a week before last called the lazy gardener mm -hmm. <laughs> talk. I love that talk. He did a great job with it. Um, but if you are, a, I think we're all a little bit of a lazy gardener. Oh, sure. The more the ground you can cover with ground covers, the less time you spend weeding, the more insects you're feeding. Yeah. Right? Less time weeding, more insects you're feeding. That's, it's a slogan. Um, so 
uh, this is a great example of that. Another one just put into the park too that I, there's two others really I'd like to mention. Um, another one is, in, is a Don Jacobs selection. And Don Jacobs ran Eco Gardens down in Georgia for years and years and years, late Don Jacobs. And everything he found and brought into horticulture has got eco in the name. Okay? Yeah. So green and gold, mm -hmm. we used to think one species, now we know it's five. Okay. And the Gulf Coast Southern form, a lot of our best heat tolerant and drought tolerant species are coming from our coastal plain here in the North, in North Carolina, down through the coastal plain of Texas, because as it warms, as it gets more volatile, it's more approaching the types of conditions those plants regularly have. Mm -hmm. So this one is Chrysogonum australi. Okay. Which is the Southern green and gold. And it's called, uh, Eco lacquered spider. Yes, I know that one very well. It's fabulous. Uh huh. This is a plant that just covers ground, and just like the cicerinkium, and just like the third plant I'll mention, which is called frog fruit or turkey tangle frog fruit, uh, Phyla nodiflora. Um, these three plants have this beautiful characteristic, which is that you can plant other things with them, and they won't choke them out. Yeah. So when you go to um, plant the lights for an open house, have a look over by our offices, by the 49 house at the huge swaths of, um, of Cicerinchium nashii and the beautiful exotic jack in the pulpits that are coming right up through it. No problems. The tulips, there's a little wild tulip that grows there um, that Tony's got planted, interplanted with it, right through it and flowering. The roots on all three of these don't go down deep into the soil. And so you can plant bulbs. You right. can plant seasonal interest plants sure. that are taller. Layered effect, yeah. Underneath them, the same way you'd plant a lasagna bulb pot. Yeah. Right? And so instead of just one thing occupying the space, you've got two, three, or four things occupying that space. That means you're feeding two, three, four times as much in the environment with the same space. Yeah, that green and gold, I remember from when I was working there. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, I was working in the greenhouses there, and it would just root into every neighboring pot. Yeah. And it, it wanted <laughs> yeah. to spread and root and spread and root. It's a great yeah. ground cover yeah. uh, with little yellow flowers and, and you know, it, yeah. it, it was just amazing. We would have to, um, in order to pick one pot out for a delivery, we'd have to literally cut uh, all the stems from the border of the pot and just cut it out and then deliver it. Yeah, <laughs> it's a very good ground cover. So, and, and the, the frog fruit, um, is another one of those plants which I'm getting ready to install at the park. It's one of those problem solvers. Frog fruit, if you're not familiar with it, it's it most it's a native plant, but it's native. It's one of these plants that's native to the world. Mm -hmm. So it's found on every continent except our, Antarctica. And this plant in North Carolina, we're used to seeing it when you go to the beach. So when you go to the beach, you park in the parking lot, little sandy parking lot down a top sail, and you get out of the car and you're walking across and there's this little stomped on flat ground cover. It has these little stems that come up with these pale lavender flowers on them, like a tiny lantana. Okay. And you would never look at this and say, here's a plant that would make a fabulous garden plant. But in fact, when I brought it into the South Carolina Botanic Garden, I planted it in an area that shouldn't really grow. Right. It was kind of dry clay soil and never got irrigation. Thought I'll never grow here because it likes in nature, either it's growing in a wet ditch with it flooded most of the time or in areas near the beach where it does have underwater groundish sources sure. of, of moisture. Turns out it doesn't need any of that. Yeah. And it turns out when you grow it in the garden, it's a nine month to 12 month flowering mass of pale lavender flowers. Um, that outcompetes any weed and is really, really attractive to little skipper butterflies that we have a hard time providing for in the oh, landscape. Yeah. It's like yeah. planting, you've seen how much comes to a lantana. Yeah. This is like planting a ground cover of lantana that flowers for 12 months out of the year in a, in a mild year and is fully hardy down to its own five. <laughs> so it's, it's unbelievable, it hasn't been used. And we're now using it to firm up um, those nasty clay banks after building a home mm -hmm. and nobody can ever get anything to live on it because nobody wants to invest in soil. Right. And plants can grow without soil. Um, well, this is a plant that, that actually can stabilize banks like that. As a rain garden plant, it can tolerate submersion for 12 months and be just beautiful. Okay. Um, it can tolerate going without water and 
our worst drought year in South Carolina, I think was uh, 2013. No problem, still flowered nine months out of the year um, with this plant. So that's the kind of thing that we really get excited, that I get sure. excited yeah, about, and I find hope a gems. lot of people get excited about. And they're not all from far off exotic places. We find some things that are just, we see every day, but we don't realize what they look like once you put them into cultivation, remove competition and let them be all, all they, they can, can be. be. Yeah. 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 We're gonna, we're definitely, I can sense that maybe a lot of our listeners are like, what did, what plant did he just say? How do you spell that? So I, after the show, I'm going to sure. get the names from you. We'll write them. We'll put them in the comments on the YouTube video. Uh, and so that y'all can have them. Cause I, I man the chat on a lot of these uh, talks and that's the number one question is what did he just say and how do you spell it? Right. Yeah, so I love that. We'll get that. We'll get all that. I love stuff that. The deep South name for the <laughs> frog fruit is turkey tangle frog fruit. Turkey tangle frog fruit. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure there's stories for both of those turkey tangle and frog <laughs> I'm fruit. I'm sure. Right? Yeah. So, well, that's really cool. Um, so any questions from, the audience. Sure. About uh, Judy was the the Asclepius you mentioned. She wanted to know if it was like susceptible to aphids or anything like that. So every milkweed that's ever existed on planet Earth is susceptible to aphids. <laughs> um, so yeah, will it get aphids? It will. Um, the great thing about this one, and one of the reasons why I really like it, is that um, rather than getting the aphids and then the plant just declining, it tends to grow so well. Uh, here where we have rain because it's from a, a near desert environment um, where we have abundant rain and, and a perfect climate for it, it outgrows the aphids. So um, you can have aphids there and still have milkweed, um, awesome. which isn't the case with a lot of the yeah, no. slower growing non ever blooming species. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Um, any other questions? Well, so Tony wanted to know with like the tree species you're choosing for the dog park in downtown Cary Park, sure. like how do you choose plants uh, that like can tolerate the urine or yeah. plants that you may yeah. need to protect somehow? So, um, yeah, I, I wasn't involved in the uh, plant choice for the dog park, but the dog park is very, very simple um, design because it, it's a small space and it's very heavily trafficked. So essentially, um, the tree species that are there are oaks uh, and trees that existed on the site. So we, we kept as, as many trees as possible during the, the construction of the site. So we have a lot of legacy trees. On Very large site. ones. Very large. Well, mo yeah, there's a huge, yeah. one of the biggest willow oaks you'll ever see is there. Um, but those trees are well established. The dog urine there, probably not an issue. For Drop them. in the bucket. And then um, we chose uh, Morella pumula, which mm -hmm. is um, dwarf wax myrtle. Smells like way to tell it from the big wax myrtle that's native here versus the coastal plain. Smaller one is the leaves on dwarf wax myrtles smell like um, when you crush them. They smell like eucalyptus. They have beta phyllum oh, green. Oh, really? In them. Okay. Yeah. Is it strong or? Very strong. Okay. Yeah, very strong. And the, the taller wax myrtle does not, just smells like wax myrtle. Um, but that's shown to be pretty tolerant so far, at least of, of the dog urine. And they did a fabulous job of choosing things that if they're broken, uh, stems, because you get Pigs. Big 70 pound yeah. dogs running through the garden, yeah. you're going to have broken stems and the kids too. And, um, with that Morella, it, it's constantly suckering. So that broken limbs, broken stems are very quickly replaced yeah. with a, uh, a very consistent foot and a half to two foot tall plant at maturity. So um, single year to get your stem that tie and then you just branch out slowly from there. So that's what's there at Excellent. the moment. And a little sp sterile spirea hybrid that I haven't seen with leaves on it yet because I've only been there since Three months, November. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's pretty much what's there. All of our, our tree selections for the park, um, canopy trees are all natives, which, which is important to have the majority of your canopy be native because that's, that's why our songbirds fly all the way back from Central and South America to breed here is because of the numbers of, of creeping little caterpillars, geometric caterpillars sure. that depend on our native trees. Good. So Linda wanted to know if the uh, Cary Park would post a list of their flower shrubs and trees. That yes, you guys yes, we will. And uh, we've, I just 
finished compiling the list of what actually went in the ground and what, what we just added. So we're working on the website design to release that. So keep Googling it or set yeah, up a Google yeah. alert for yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. plant list and, from and, Donald um, Perry Park. Yeah, it's pretty, it's, it's getting more impressive by the week. <laughs> Sure. And every new garden goes through an entry phase and then yeah. it's going to evolve quickly and then it's going to mature and, and you yeah. know, yeah. It'd be awesome. And you're watch. in that early phase. Yeah. So you get to try all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so y'all may have noticed that Patrick speaks pretty easily on TV. Uh, I just w wanted to bring up a little bit thing from his past. Um, he had a TV show. Uh, in South Carolina, and it ran for how many seasons? How many episodes? We filmed for fifteen years. Fifteen years and ninety-nine episodes. I think is what we cut up to. So there's fifteen seasons. No, there's not fifteen seasons. We filmed for fifteen years, but I think we released um, ten seasons overall okay. over the fifteen years. So uh, we were on. We started out with South Carolina Education Educational Television, which uh, is our PBS mm -hmm. network in South Carolina, and then. Um, produced seasons through that were distributed to NIDA and then finally through American Public Television through APT, which is still the way that the program is is still being shown all over the country. Yeah. Oh, good. I um, So, yeah, I wanted to mention it because uh, uh, it is I, w I Googled the show and uh, ended up at the South Carolina PBS website. And uh, I'll, most of the episodes are behind a paywall, but you can watch season one of epi uh, no, episode one of seasons one, two, three, and four. Yeah, on it for uh, on APT season Free one, two, on the yeah. web. Yeah, and you can buy them on Amazon Prime. Yeah, and, and you can buy them, yeah. or you can get yeah. a, uh, oh, donate to PBS and get a passport. If you're a PBS stuff. member, then you have a passport and they're all they're all available. Yeah, they're all right? available if you yeah. have a passport. Yeah, so. that was a great show, that was great fun. That was a lot of work doing that show. <laughs> I can imagine, <laughs> great yeah. Fun. Yeah, and um, uh, the, the bits I've seen, they looked really interesting. You know, you talked, uh, there was, talking about Saracenias and talking about little, you're up in the uh, snowy mountains, talking about little sun, oh, yeah. we sun went, drops or something. We went yeah. from pole to pole. Yeah. Um, oh, it was just over the whole the, world? Or? In the new world. New world, so okay. It was, they were all based in North and South America, North, South, Central America, Very and interesting. Caribbean. Um, but the, the thing I liked about it was, unlike a show that just takes you out to, ooh, we're gonna talk about crocodiles. I, we tried to make each show um, themed towards exactly the same thing comes out of my mouth every time I talk to anybody, which is, you know, you're important in the world. We're connected. This is how things work and how people fit in. And to get you really to know the place where we were at, how does it function? Mm -hmm. what, what role do people play in that? And so, you know, it's the kind of show where you can go off, whisk off to a rainforest and spend half the program talking about plants instead of just pythons you yeah know? <laughs> yeah um so it, but the show was so. it was it was plants for all you plant nerds but it was also birds and it, it was all kinds it was of uh wildlife yeah yeah so uh, a lot of them were themed on um on wildlife but you can't theme a show on wildlife and not talk about plants that oh no for sure basis of the yeah, wildlife yeah. system yeah and so i was able to bring my passion for botany to play throughout every and it, and it really shows the one I saw that really tickled my fancy was you were you were looking at um, the pitcher plant uh, Saracenia rosia oh yeah and uh, you were you pointed the camera down into the pitcher where the liquid was and the dissolving bugs were and then you were talking about the uh, biochemistry of the yeah. of the liquid all the <laughs> enzymes that are in it that are causing the plant bugs Estrace, to dissolve amylase exactly and yeah. exactly yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, anyone who's had you know college biology, she's like, ah, I know what those are. Yeah, that yeah. was really that was really uh, yeah an interesting show, it, real it, nerdy show. It like was that. it's a very nerdy show. Yeah, and uh, that was the thing that everybody thought wouldn't work about doing it was that it was a little too. Um, I did. We didn't want to just make it entertainment. We wanted education to be entertaining, which is kind of the idea with PBS. And Yeah, yeah, it's perfect um, for PBS. It's a perfect show. Yeah. It's not and too so nerdy. It was great because we yeah. didn't have to really take things to a level where you did, you couldn't get something deep about or as specific as you wanted yeah. <laughs> about each one of the programs. So check it out. Uh, it's very interesting. If you have a passport, even better, uh, PBS passport. Yeah, PBS passport. Uh, Join your so, local PBS. Yeah, 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 sure. Support them. Um, okay, and you also have a book which is pretty recent in your last couple yeah. years October 22 and um, it's about 
plants of South Carolina, but it, there's a lot of overlap, right? Oh, so yeah. if you live in North Carolina, it'd be a great book to check out as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. So it's a it's Guide to the Wildflowers of South Carolina. It's Macmillan, Porsche, Rainer, and White. Mm -hmm. um, my photographer and videographer, David White, from the TV show helped to do all of the um, image sure, capturing up and, yeah. and you name it. Um, but yeah, it's way more than just a wildflower book. It's, um, it's very deep into, um, ecology, understanding even how to introduce the plants like this into your garden and what they'll sure. do for, for your garden. Um, and it's, it's a lot of information on each plant. So the book is not a little, they call it, it's not really a field guide. It's it's pretty fat <laughs> yeah, yeah. and it's got beautiful photographs. My, my co-author and my mentor, uh, Dr. Richard Porsche took about three quarters of what's in there. And, uh, Dr. Ed Pavorn in Clemson, quite a few and myself, uh, quite a few photographs also. I, I have uh, hyperlinks. I don't know if uh, Blake's got them. He says he's posting them to the chat, uh, of the link to the P to the TV show that I found. And also the link to the book, which is from USC press. Uh, so it takes you to the USC press site, although you can probably get it anywhere. Yeah. Amazon. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Anywhere. Um, and, um, uh, Pat McMillan has also done, uh, lectures for the JCRA before. And so, um, uh, we have one of them is up for public consumption. It, it's, it's a talk you did for NARGS a while back. Um, and, it's and a real nerdy talk. He does yeah. the natural community garden. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And that kind of ties into what we were yeah. started our conversation yeah. today. With. You know, it's, it's really funny because since before COVID, I was doing over a hundred public presentations a year at Clemson. Uh, when COVID came in, I decided I'd had kind of enough administration and that's a lot of power administration. Yeah. I, I, I was a director of four things and yeah. a professor. And everything. So uh, when COVID came, my favorite part about, in, about being at the university was teaching. And with remote teaching, I was just like, nah. Not, yeah. <laughs> and I, I did it for two semesters. And um, the second semester, I did half of that semester from Washington State. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I decided I, it was, I wanted to scale back uh, and focus more on growing plants and mm -hmm. interacting with people in the garden, uh, a big change. Um, but also we went a couple years where we didn't interact with anything but a computer screen when we were doing presentations. Yeah. I think that was the first presentation I gave in person. Yeah. It was the NARGS thing after, after COVID. <laughs> and it took all the way up until two and two weeks ago for me to feel like I was back to being able to channel energy to transfer out to the audience to okay to give a good presentation yeah um it took a long time well you were at uh South, southeastern plant symposium uh put yeah. on by jlbg and jcr was that last year or the year before year I don't before yeah. and i had covid yeah it was, <laughs> was, it was a good talk though it was a good talk <laughs> yeah uh, but yeah um uh, i've seen you speak publicly you're they're all very interesting oh yeah. well thank you um okay so uh um I'm going to change gears unless Blake has a question from the audience he wants to. Well, I, I did have, there's kind of two questions that I kind of wanted to see. Sure. Sandy had a question about mammal pressure, deer and rabbits at the downtown Cary Park. But then kind of going off of that, Tony had another one. She said that rumor has it that you had to replace a thousand plants following the overwhelming response to opening days and months and crowd trampling. Is, is that true? No. No. <laughs> no. Well, um, no, we haven't really, um, I mean, obviously, you know, it, it, when, when you plant any landscape, you plant it and then you have to see where people are going to use. You can't really, you know, design perfect ever. And so there are certain areas where we're changing because people are kind of forcing that change. Um, and that's totally natural for a park. But um, oh, yeah. We, we've had areas where plants have obviously gotten a lot of overuse, um, but we haven't really replaced anything in the park yet. Um, so we, we probably won't start um, rearranging and reimagining spaces for a little while yet, but yeah. 
Yeah. Okay, but so what, what about the, other? The, the, the deer and rabbit pressure? Oh, deer and rabbit. We have no deer pressure whatsoever. No Zero. It's all the dog urine keeps the deer away. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, no dog pressure. And I've, it, we have one rabbit uh, that stays all the way on the edge of the property by Park Street and chews away at uh, Discampsia cespitosa, which is a plant. I don't know if it'll be a long term or here anyway. But really, no rabbit issue either. So I think that I think you're right. There's a lot of dogs. Like people really enjoy the park and really enjoy having dogs in the park. And I think that's that's probably a, a good thing when it comes to sure. deer rabbit. Pressure. Yeah. Integrated pest management. There yeah, you go. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, so I'm going to change gears. Um, during our lunch a month ago, we talked that you lived in Chile for a while. Yeah, I spent four years in Chile. And um, we did discuss, you said there were very few or almost none. <laughs> Are there any Chilean plants? Not really. Not really. <laughs> Not really. Tony grows one plant from central Chile. I can't even bring the name up in my head right now. But um, yeah, the Ch it's, it's interesting because that was a place where, you know, when I worked at Heronswood in, in Washington State, uh, while I was there, we actually designed a, um, a Valdivian rainforest garden, which was great because the first time I was ever able to bring my love of Chile and Chilean plants into a, a garden space because that's perfect there. But it's the exact opposite kind of place from what we're talking about because Chile has a maritime climate or maritime Mediterranean, depending on where you're at, or sub-Antarctic if you're all the way down in, in the Cape Horn. Um, and that means it it's like Scott. Okay. Yeah. It it's never it's never hot. Um, it's never frigid. And it's moist continuously. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, absolutely not drought tolerant plants in South Chile. Absolutely not heat tolerant plants in Chile. They die immediately upon encountering humidity at all because it, it's one of those weird places where it rains a lot, but it's also not stifling heat and it doesn't have the humidity problems. Yet. Kind of so, makes me want to move there. <laughs> it's an incredible place. Um, one of the things that really, it, it shocked a lot of people. I used to like to tell it as like a tale people. I, I was, I got to, to work in Chile. I was doing, um, we had a, a, a person who was a, a, a big benefactor to Clemson uh, who had developed a, uh, eco resort down in the 10th region of Chile and this wonderful place called Hacienda Parga. And they invited me to go down. And so I went down with a group of, you know, folks from the university to just check this place out. And I went down, I did not know, I knew two plants in all of, of the Valdivian rainforest. And one of them was uh, plant and weed. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the other was pampas grass. <laughs> so um, I wasn't an expert, but I, because my background, I'm just a plant nerd. So I know plant families. So I, I know a lot about the families that are common there in other places. And, and there are families like Atoxicaceae. The Atoxicon is one species, one genus, one family sure. in the world. And it's only there. Um, and so there were some things I knew nothing about, but I went down and I did the tour for the governor and, and president of Chile, Chile. Chile. <laughs> of their region. own place. Yes, okay. of their own place. But the guy said, oh, can you give them a tour? Because I'd taken the, our group along through the, the rainforest. And at the end, uh, Patricio Vaispin, who was the governor of the 10th region, he, he, he says, look, um, we've got we really want you to do. Uh, surveys down here and of course the guy that I was down there visiting is like you got to come back and do surveys so I made my way back to Chile to do these um, these surveys of these properties and, and baseline inventories of everything plants and all biodiversity um, and so I had to learn all the plants and I started learning them on the plane flight to Chile the next time okay by the time I got to the ground I had all 464 easily learned is there a four dummies book for Chile plants that you have? No, on you have to pull it from all yeah. kinds of resources, not okay. just one guide to the book to the plants of Chile. But, you know, I tell people that and they're like, oh, my, how could you learn 464? At the time, I'm living in, in Pickens County, South Carolina. We have close to 2,000 species of plants in Pickens County. We have over 2,000 species in Berkeley County, South Carolina. 
464 is nothing. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, when you, when you compare places that we think of in our mind as being so outrageously exotic and, and teeming with life and so strange, and then you bring those actual hard numbers home, you start to realize that Wake County, Brunswick County, you know, Buncombe County, these are places that are hard to beat almost unless you're going to the gorges of, of China, you're going to have a hard time beating the amazing biodiversity that we enjoy every single day at home. Yeah. Yeah. So we live in a great place and we can grow great plants. Um, to grow we more do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like to, I like to hike on the weekends and I, I love just seeing the little wildflowers all over the place yeah. on all the different trails around yeah. here. It's really great. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, how are we doing on time, Blake? We are out of time. We are out of time. Oh, I just had one more thing, but that's Go okay. Go for it. No, do it. All do right. it. So at our lunch, he, he says, do you want to know how to predict the next super cold spell uh, that's going to come to North Carolina? And then he, uh, so take it from there. How do you predict the next cold spell we're going to get? So I'm a nerd. And so I, I, I look at a lot of different things. And if you're a botanic garden director, you're looking at everything, particularly if you're like in South Carolina growing zone nine plants in the zone eight. So you're always worried about the cold. And I'm also very interested in climate changes and volatility and things like that. So I actually have, this is, this works. <laughs> so it's anecdotal, it's anecdotal, it it's, but it's actually, it's <laughs> anecdotal. I'm not a climatologist. Okay. But it does work. Um, and it, one of the things that works is if you go, there's a site called the NSIDCC Ice Index. Okay. Blake has the link. He's okay. posting it to the chat. I love to look at this site. It shows you um, the satellite views of how much sea ice is in the Arctic. And in years, when the Bering Sea, which is that chunk of Arctic Ocean that's just off of Barrow, Alaska, just off mm -hmm. or oop, Guyvia or whatever it's called. It's got a. It, it's got change. a new name. Yeah. I, can, I'm, I apologize. I don't know the name, and I'm not no, no, meaning. It, I'm not meaning that to be any cultural thing. But they change it to a, a Nupiak name, and I just don't speak a Nupiak. Right, and I, yeah. I very much appreciate it's a very that it's no longer the city formerly known as the Barrow. city. Yeah, the city formerly known as Barrow. Um, but the Bering Sea, when the sea ice doesn't lock up to the shore by the first or second week in December. Um, we're far more prone to get Alberta clippers that reach down into North Carolina and South Carolina. And one of the reasons for this is because water is a great insulator. And it also has a latent heat of evaporation and a little bubble of warmer air that forms over the water. So polar vortices, and we used to call these Alberta clippers, now they call them polar vortex. It's better for the right? news. And they name yeah. the storms so that everybody's I'm just frightened of them. <laughs> but when you get the polar vortex, the jet stream bends down, uh, land, air over land can settle, cold air can settle over land far better than it can settle over water. So until the sea ice locks up, you're, it, it appears to me we're much more at risk for uh, cold air dropping down. But the real key is to go and look on your weather app and look up the city formerly known as Barrow. Which Blake uh, has the link for. Right. And if you see the, the temperature in, I'll try, I'm going to try to get it right. It's Utkiakvik. Utkiakvik. Ut 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 and a bunch of other letters. Kiakvik. It's got, a, <laughs> today it's negative uh, 20 Fahrenheit in Utkiakvik. So that's a good March te or February temperature. Yep. Yeah. And when you, when you see the weather there at the very top of the world start to rise up close to the freezing point during December, January, early February, five to seven days, we will have an absolute, later, we will have an absolutely horrendous cold snap. So when it's warm there, relatively speaking, it gets really cold here almost a week later. It tells you without having to go look at the map where the bubble of warm air is forcing the polar vortex down into the into the United States. So y'all should look at this so you know when to cover your <laughs> hostas. <laughs> For uh, real. It works. It worked. It's worked every single time. Even um, our last really cold spell we had this year and the uh, only cold spell when really that cold that we had this year down to 19. And um, the cold we had on Christmas Eve was preceded with a warm yeah. bubble. Yeah. Okay. In 
Foot Piat. So there's your there's your anecdotal, <laughs> almost scientific tip. I've used, I've used it for two decades and yeah. it never fails. Never failed. I, I start preparing for cold weather days before everybody else. Excellent. I think that's a great way to finish up. Are there any questions more from the audience? No, you said it, then. As okay, y'all have your all, all your links. Y'all can uh, go start playing and investigating stuff. And, and thank go, you. Go visit the the downtown Cary Park. It's, yeah, visit it's, the park. Cary's an amazing. Get a beer. You need a beer visit. there. Oh, I was excited to see that. It's the most amazing park and in a most amazing yeah, place in yeah. Cary. So. Thank you very much for coming out today. It's yeah. a great talk. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Patrick, and thank you, Dennis, for leading us through this conversation. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We will be back next week. Goodness me, I really need to look at these before we get there. Oh, yes. Next Wednesday at 3 o'clock, we'll be going through Sophia's Top Plant Picks, our nursery technician. So that will be lots of fun. I hope you all will join us for that. We'll see you all next week. Y'all take care. <laughs>